Fantastic. We are live now. Hi, everyone. It's Mitch Rollick, the host of Ideas on the Verge. And before we get building an ecologically sustainable and just society. They walk their talk by printing their books in North America, never overseas, on 100% post-consumer recycled paper. They are carbon neutral and have been since 2006. Their employees are all shareholders and they are a certified B Corporation. If you wanna know more, head on over to www.newsociety.com. Today, I have an amazing guest, Bruce King, whose cause is as noble as his surname. Bruce has been a structural engineer for 35 years, designing buildings of every size and type around the world. He is the founder and director of the Ecological Building Network and the Build Well Conferences on Green Building Materials. Bruce's decades of research into alternative building systems has led to building code changes in California and elsewhere in the world. Bruce is the author of The New Carbon Architecture, Building to Cool the Climate, alongside a lot of other stars in this sphere. This book is a paradigm shifting tour of the innovations in architecture and constructions that are making change happen. Whether that be office towers built from advanced wood products, affordable low carbon concrete alternatives, or plastic cleaned from the oceans and turned into building blocks. Bruce, welcome to the show. How the heck Thank are you? Thank you. Thank you. Products, affordable oh low carbon. I just need to pause that, okay. You froze on me for a moment oh, there, Bruce? Bruce. I hope you didn't for everybody else. Sorry, I missed that last little bit there. You froze on me for a moment there in your intro. I, oh, I'm no. Hoping it didn't also happen to all the whoever might be listening. All right, I'll close all my internet sucking things. There we go. Uh, well, Bruce, you have been involved in the green building space since the late 1970s. What is the most surprising thing you've encountered on this journey? The most surprising thing, oh yeah. boy, um, that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, gee, uh, that um, what's well, like? The, uh, I guess it's like they say about technology. It seems like everything's taking forever, and change just won't happen. And the change that you feel needs to happen in the world isn't happening. And then all of a sudden. It happens really fast, which is kind of what's happening right now with awareness about climate change. That mm. change will never be fast enough for me, but it's probably going about as fast as it possibly can right now. So I'm always surprised at how either slow or fast things do change and people do become aware. Cool. And what are some of the more memorable moments that have led you to where you are now? Long ago, when I first published a book, 20, almost 25 years ago, Buildings of Earth and Straw, I, I designed my first straw bale building and it had some earthen walls and uh, this was all brand new to me or anybody else at that point. And I gathered what information I could as the engineer. And um, when the project was done, it was, it was a wonderful, still one of the funnest and uh, coolest green projects I ever did, the Real Good Solar Living Center in Hopland, California. And uh, I had a lot of lifetime friendships out of that. And so I said, well, this stuff is getting popular. Straw bale construction was taking off and becoming a really big deal. So I said, maybe I should write all this stuff down and make it easier for any other engineer or architect after me to do this. So that's what I did. And the book had some notoriety. And it was for a long time, it was the only book on anything technical design for natural materials. Mm -hmm. Got me an invitation to Belfast, North Ireland. And because uh, I, I knew one of the professors at Queen's University and a lot of stories I could tell about just visiting Belfast, North Ireland, but it ended up with my giving a slideshow that night at the university. It was slides back then. And uh, when I was done, this, this old sunburned guy in dungarees at the back of the room raised his hand and said, I live in the house, uh, an earthen house, a cob house that my great grandfather built. 
and all the generations since have lived in it. And now the authorities are telling me I have to tear it down and replace it with, with modern materials, concrete block or whatever. He said, what can I do? I don't want to do that, but they're telling me I have to do that. And the whole room was silent. There were a couple hundred people. And I said, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. But it made such an impact on me because his was not at all an unusual story or 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 particular to Belfast, North Ireland. It's happening all over the world that people who are living in historic natural homes mm -hmm. or want to have them again and recreate them, this natural building community that uh, New Society is very supportive of. Um, they come up against modern building codes, which sometimes with good reason and sometimes not. And uh, But that moment hit me, it stuck with me and it made me resolve say, well, maybe I can do something to make it easier for people to keep that old historic family home if they want to, or to build one anew if they want to and, and have it work and not have it be some a failure of an experiment it was a bummer for everybody so i've tried to d devote my my abilities as an engineer and a material scientist to helping natural buildings go forward awesome yeah so could you could you provide us with a little bit of background on on the work you do on a day-to-day -day basis um yeah and in <laughs> In my case, it's not really that different during the pandemic uh, in that I, I write. You know, I'm, write, I'm finishing a book, Build Beyond Zero, which expands beyond uh, what we did with the new carbon architecture. My co-author, Chris Magwood, is well known to perhaps a lot of you folks. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very exciting to be working on it. It's, it's been a great time to be writing. I just sit here and write. And I don't notice the pandemic. You know, we, ha we have food to eat. We're, we're safe. We're secure. And I feel almost embarrassed by how well I've got it, but this is what I do. Um, I, I could take more engineering jobs and have more income and be financially better off with my family. And it's just, it would just bore the shit out of me. Uh, and, and my wife would then have to live with bored me. And so we both agreed that wasn't the best way to go. And so I do still do some engineering work. Interesting yeah. jobs do come my way, but uh, mostly I'm writing. I have lots of opportunity uh, through the various networks I'm part of to, then put my shoulder to various wheels and um, especially with uh, the carbon leadership forum out of Seattle and the embodied carbon network are have quickly become the central foci of, of work with buildings and climate. Mm -hmm. Ed Masria and architecture 2030. There's just a lot of people, more and more people all the time doing really cool work. And I get called into various efforts. And nowadays, sometimes there's even, they're even paying gigs because the world more broadly is aware of this and philanthropic organizations and the government are aware of this uh, and starting to throw money at like, how do we, you know, here's an, here's a, both a problem and an opportunity to do something about climate through building. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that leads well to my next question, which is uh, what's, what's the point of doing what you do? Why, why do we need to be building with carbon and incorporating that into our infrastructure? Well, the, the, the short story is, is sort of what led to this book you mentioned, The New Carbon Architecture, that uh, I published four years ago with New Society, that it started out um, my talking to a lot of my colleagues back then, the community of people working in so-called embodied carbon, the upfront emissions. When you build something, you've already put a blob of carbon in the air from making the cement and the steel and carving up the wood and whatever you did. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, we should, we've got to write a book about this sort of for general interest, because right now it's just geeky stuff amongst ourselves. And we said, yeah, and they, everybody, a lot of people contributed to it. And, um, but I realized really quickly on that, it, that though it started as just a report on embodied carbon matters, everybody pay attention to it. And it was going to land like another big old bummer on everybody's desk. Like, okay, here's another big problem that I have to pay attention to as an architect or an engineer or a builder. Oh, the embodied carbon. Okay, now... You know, one more thing, but I quickly realized, we all started to realize that it was that, but much more importantly, it was an opportunity to do something positive, that we could flip the built environment from being this massive climate villain to a massive climate hero, mm -hmm. from an emitter to something that could actually absorb the carbon out. If we pull the carbon out of the air, everybody knows, everybody's figuring out now that we have to get it out of the air. If we stopped our emissions on a dime tomorrow somehow, that wouldn't be good enough. We still have to pull carbon out of the air. There's like a trillion 
tons that we've put up since the Industrial Revolution. Once we do, where are we going to put it? Yeah. Pumping it underground, problematic. Um, getting a lot of it back into the soil. We've deep carbonized all the agricultural soil in the world over the last hundred years. Now we have to get it back into the soil. That's a great place to put it. But buildings by far are the biggest users of physical stuff in the world. We, in the, we who build just use a lot of stuff and that's where we can put the carbon. So that's the effort that I and a lot of my colleagues are working on now. Yeah, awesome. It's just that this is a quote from the book um, very in the introduction. It says, we are in technological reach within a generation of a global construction industry that is not only net zero, generating more energy than it needs to operate, but in its materials draws more carbon out of the air than it puts up. And so how, I'm wondering how accessible is all of this knowledge and do enough people know about this to um, make a huge change? Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, for the current book, um, and Chris and I have been working on it for six months, and we sort of belatedly realized, well, we should really have something about how much carbon can we store in the built environment? I mean, that's the obvious question that people are going to ask. Well, how much? Mm -hmm. And so we started asking around and, and reading what literature there was. It's a lot of academic work. Um, uh, and it's a very complicated answer, as you might imagine. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of trends at work and a lot of unknowns and a lot of variables. And try to predict 30 years out. I mean, try to predict one year out. Try to predict next week. Mm -hmm. Forget it. We're on this hockey stick where everything is changing so rapidly now that nobody can keep track. That's why we're all, part of why we're all stressed out all the time, because we don't know what's going to happen next week, much less 10 years, 30 years. That said, we're with, I, I stand by the statement you just read. We're within a generation of flipping it around and making a, the built environment a net carbon absorber. There's a few things technologically we still need to work out, but they're not really very hard to do. It's mostly cultural and social and psychological. Mm -hmm. and obviously here in, in the United States, there's a lot of people who are still just denying that humans cause climate change. Um, in governments of the world, there's as uh, Greta keeps reminding us, basically haven't done anything. Uh, they make pronouncements, they announce goals, they form commissions, uh, but we really haven't done anything. The, the curve of carbon in the atmosphere measured at Mauna Koa, which is the benchmark everybody uses, it just passed 420, passed 421. And it's a very smooth curve from the beginning of the industrial revolution. We basically haven't gotten the message or you might also say more sadly that the oil companies have managed to keep us from getting the message yeah. by obfuscating and saying, well, we're still not sure. And a lot of nonsense. We are sure we have been sure for a long time, but we're not acting on it because it, it might make us less comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's quite so that's really, that's the challenge. It's, it's not technological. We can reinvent concrete and we can figure out how to work with straw and agricultural byproducts. And we can, work with algae and bacteria to do things we haven't even imagined yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I keep, my, my reference point is, is World War II when Franklin Roosevelt was visited by Albert Einstein and who said, you know, well, you could make a weapon with this thing called new atomic power. And he said, okay, and he signed an executive order and it's two and a half years later, there was a, the first human caused bright flash in the New Mexico desert. We'd set off an atomic bomb for better or for worse. But two and a half years, a whole bunch of guys who didn't even speak the same language gathered at some old rickety boys school up in the mountains of New Mexico, made it happen. In other words, when we decide to do something as human beings, get out of our way. We're badass, <laughs> for better or for worse. Yeah. So if we as, if we as as a if, as Americans or as uh, human beings decide this is what we have to do, and maybe COVID will serve to help us think of in one direction together um that's what it's going to take once we do that i'm sure we can solve it boom yeah well the impetus is most certainly there this is something we absolutely have to do um 
And one, one of the things from the book that I found pretty interesting was that uh, one ton of carbon is equivalent to 3.67 tons of carbon dioxide, given the atomic weights of either um, elements so, or um, molecule rather. Um, so is this easier than it seems to be? If we are sequestering carbon, are we effectively, um, is there like a 3.67 ratio where for every one molecule of, or atom of carbon that we're sequestering? Yeah, ratio of the molecular weights of a, of a uh, carbon molecule versus a um, CO2 molecule. Oxygen is a molecular weight 16. So 3.67. So if you if I sequester a ton of carbon in my building, I've effectively removed 3.67 tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Unfortunately, that works both ways. When my house burns down, I really want that one ton of carbon becomes 3.67 tons of CO2. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I'm, and we're acutely aware of fire here in California, where we've have had had some pretty bad fires, the worst ever recently, and fully expect that there'll be plenty more yeah that's, that's that's a complicated question but it's very much exacerbated if not caused by climate disruption but yes the uh basically using plants to get the carbon is a great idea let mother nature do the work and you you get that ratio uh and with wood or with straw or with hemp or with bamboo um but it's also worth noting that we nonetheless still need to build these big contraptions that you see pictures of now for carbon, for, for, for sucking carbon out of the air or filtering it out of the air. And I used to, I was one of those who used to think, well, that's silly. Why don't, you know, haven't they ever heard of trees and trees will do that for free and so on. But what trees won't do and what straw won't do is gather the carbon out of the air and deliver it to you as carbon dioxide gas or liquid which you can then use to make concrete and other building materials that we use all over the place mm -hmm. and s store it in a mineral durable way in the built environment. So we're developing the ability to mechanically harvest carbon at all the smokestacks of all the power plants. Mm -hmm. And then the infrastructure to move it around and use it to make, make buildings. Yeah. In tandem with also using as much plant material as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the technology is there and we have, we know what to do. I'd, I'd love to go through your book and uh, section by section almost and give people the Coles notes or sort of say about it, um, which by the way, we, we do have a coupon code for anyone listening. If you go to newsociety.com and go to um, um, the book and enter in coupon code new carbon architecture 20, you'll get 20% off for the next three days. And just a reminder that anyone in the crowd who has questions, please answer or please ask them and we will get to them at the end of this interview. The first section is called Beyond Zero, the Time Value of Carbon. And it's a lot about um, the different components or chunks of pie with carbon. So there's a couple of chunks, operational, which is one, but it's not the whole thing. So what can you tell us about embodied carbon and all of its facets? Um. Well, uh, any building project basically has two phases. You build it and then you use it. Mm -hmm. And I can hear a lot of people saying, oh no, what about before you built it? And what about after you tear it down, et cetera? Yes, there's actually lots of phases and it gets a good deal more complicated, but it's, it's worth keeping the simple model for a moment saying, there's the emissions from building it and then the emissions from using it. The emissions from building it are from the materials you use and the trucks roaring around and all of that. And then over time, uh, you're running the lights, you're running heating, air conditioning, all the things to power a building. And the general understanding for the whole 30 years I've been messing around in the green building movement, um, as far as we could tell with just about any building type and just about any climate, the operating emissions were far, far bigger than the embodied emissions over the lifetime of the building. But when we started to realize, well, we're in climate emergency and we'd actually need to be thinking about just the next couple decades. And when you zero in like that, the embodied emissions actually become the bigger thing. And that gets even amplified when you're doing net zero buildings, when you're doing energy efficient buildings where the operating emissions have gone way down anyway, you still have that big chunk of 
embodied upfront emissions that are up there cooking away from the moment you make the cement or make the steel or cut the tree. Yeah. So they have a time value that ex exacerbates their effect. And so uh, the folks at Architecture 2030, uh, Aaron McDade from Architecture 2030 wrote that chapter um, that they figure that on, in general, if you build something this year, three fourths of your climate impact for these crucial next two decades, three fourths of the impact of your building is with the embodied emissions of the materials you chose, not from the operating. This, this doesn't mean don't build an energy efficient building, don't insulate it and all of that, but you have to pay attention to materials you choose to use. Mm -hmm. And uh, why, why Chris and I are working together is because Chris has done such groundbreaking work, especially with residential construction, which tends to get ignored with one, two, three story buildings. All the things you can do with off the shelf materials right from Home Depot to radically reduce your carbon footprint right at the outset. Matters a bunch. Yeah, especially it's interesting that that um, happens with the technology that we have growing and the know-how to make these buildings super efficient. We really need to hone in on just that getting it up. It's, it's not enough to just make it efficient. You need to do it efficiently as well. Yeah. Um, so that does and in fact, as a, as a very large by the way there, 95% of the time, if, you, if you're contemplating a building project, you want to build a school, you want to build a house, you want to build an office. If you can find an existing building that no one's using or is underutilized and make it work and fix it up, give it an energy retrograde, retrofit and adaptive reuse as the architects say, that almost surely will be better for the climate by a big margin than if you built something brand new, even if it's lead platinum or living futures or, yeah. it's way, 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 way better. As long as there's some good bones, good structure and some skin you can work with, um, reuse an existing building, much better thing to do. Yeah, it's still gonna cost less carbon, so to say, to- Yeah, usually less money too. Yeah, but. yeah. Um, <clears throat> that leads into one of my, Next question, we can't build our way out of this issue in the sense that there's so much existing infrastructure around us. And historically, uh, as humans, we've always built with what's around us and what's around us now is existing infrastructure. And in the book, it was described as being both incredibly effective and radical to, to go this way rather than building brand new buildings. Um, so can you comment on why it's so radical to just use what's around us? And What's um, what's so effective about it as well? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what I wrote there, but it, and, and I don't know, radical is the word, but very often, um, you know, people love brand new stuff. You know, uh, it, there's a psychology, at least here in the affluent parts of the world, like where you and I live, mm -hmm. to. Uh, I mean, like here in Marin County, which is kind of an extreme sample, is a very affluent county. And um, as an engineer, there have been many projects I've had where somebody would buy a, a multi-million piece of property, a house with a view of the bay kind of a thing. And they just scrape whatever's there, literally scrape it off in a day with a D9 bulldozer mm -hmm. and then build what they want. And that the amount of money involved was trivial to them. They didn't want to, you know, screw around trying to make something there work. Eh, just take it all away. Mm -hmm. And we do that with commercial buildings, um, even ones that are only 5, 10, 15 years old. We say, oh, we want something else, and we scrape it off. Um, and to tell people, to tell an American, you can't do that. Uh, there's no sell, you know. We're, we're so freakishly into don't tell me what to do. Uh, so we in particular are difficult to govern. And we don't need to go into a lot of sidebar about that and the mm -hmm. era of Trump and all of that, but um, human beings through most of history, we made good use of whatever we had because it's pretty much all that we had. You know, if you had a, like um, in the early colony, colonial days in North America, people would build barns and uh, other kinds of buildings. And then if for one reason or another, they had to abandon the barn. They would burn it down in order to recover the bolts and spikes and nails that were there to be had. Because wood was so cheap, that didn't matter, 
There was an yeah. endless forest going all the way out across the continent. But metal was rare and hard to come by. So that's what they valued. Now we don't value anything because comparatively we can uh, just replace it. Material stuff is cheap to those of us in the affluent part of the world. And it's very expensive to people. Like I worked in Haiti for a while and I've worked in Brazil a bit. And where people aren't well-to-do, uh, labor is cheap and, and nails and spikes and pieces of pipe and roofing are expensive. So they preserve them and reuse them on over and over again. Mm -hmm. Somehow we have to get back to that sort of an attitude towards buildings and everything else. It would certainly be nice to get back to that with electronics so that we're not flooding the world with e-waste, which is, so, you know, how are we going to deal with that? Yeah, that's a challenge. And but our, we're not, we're not, a, we've, we've completely lost the sense of keeping and fixing things. I mean, I'm a, I'm a little obsessive about that around my house and my family makes fun of me and it's actually only to a point, but if I can fix something, I will. Yeah. Just on principle. It's just, I just, it's just, I don't want to just buy another one. I want to yeah. see if I can make this work. Yeah. Just fix it. And it's, you know, there's no feedback on when we just get rid of something. It's okay. It's out of sight, out of mind now, but really those consequences are quite, quite dire. Right. There is no way to throw yeah. things. There's, maybe there once was when there weren't very many human beings and there was lots of open land, but now there isn't. Mm -hmm. in, in the book, it says um, between 2015 and 2050, an equivalent of an entire New York City will be built every 35 days for 35 years straight. And it's quite obvious that uh, global, the global building sector must be carbon free by 2050 in order to meet the Paris Agreement. And in, in your mind, if it was, if this was easy, what would that look like? If this was easy, I mean, if suddenly everybody woke up and said, yeah, this is what we have to do. Well, that'd be great. <laughs> I'd be dancing in the streets. <laughs> but how we might actually accomplish that is, is a much tougher haul. Um, that number is, a, is, again, something I stole from Architecture 2030, um, who's doing just great work in many ways with buildings and climate. But that new New York City every month is happening right now. And it might seem incredible to perhaps most of you who are, who are listening to this in North America because it isn't happening here. It's happening in China and India and, and in a de another decade will be happening in Africa and, and Latin America. I, since I've written that, I um, visited Cairo, Egypt Partly because I'd written the book and, and this was a big conference and they wanted to hear more about it. Um, but it was, it, it was completely jaw dropping to see Cairo. Um, you know, after the conference, my wife came and joined me and we took a boat up the Nile and saw the antiquities that we've all read about growing up. And it, that was truly awesome, which I highly recommend. It's a, unfortunately Egypt is a police state again under this guy, Sisi, but, um, so it's awful conditions for the people, but go there and support them because they need the income from tourists. And, and it's extraordinary to see the pyramids and, and all the things up and down the Nile. But that said, when I got there, uh, I saw a city that's gone from 5 million to 20 million in 20 years. It's, and it's all concrete and brick splattered across the desert for miles and miles and miles, mm -hmm. endless concrete building, no insulation anywhere. Uh, occasionally somebody had enough power and enough money to have a you know, window mounted air conditioner, but um, it, was, it was real, real different than what you see in North America or Northern Europe. It was just concrete, it was primitive. And for a lot of people living there, it was still better than what they had where they came from. As it is for people in China who are all moving to the East Coast into these mega cities, uh, not just the ones you know about, the ones you've never heard about that are still bigger than Toronto. Um, and they're building with concrete. So yeah. reinventing concrete is, is central to all of this. And we, uh, we've dedicated a large part of this book coming out to concrete and what's happening in that realm, what in the near term, the medium term and long term, how are we gonna make artificial rock is at the center of all of this. Yeah, and that, that was actually one of my uh, next questions for you. Is, um, concrete is, um, well, when you put a ton, uh, when you make a ton of concrete, you're putting a ton or more of carbon dioxide into the air. 
and we're running out of the gravel and sand to make it and we don't have the capacity in order to make enough of it for the coming population so what are some of the efforts being made right now to essentially reinvent cement well first i'll correct you um yes, and it's, it's commonly done that people um treat concrete and cement as synonyms when they're not uh you get a ton of emissions for every ton of cement that you make mm. but concrete itself is a very low carbon building material because it's only a few it's 10 or 20 percent cement mm. um you know concrete is artificial rock you take a bunch of sand and a bunch of gravel and you mix them with some glue and you spray them or pack them or pour them into a mold and there you go you've got a highway or a building or a pantheon or a pyramid and um the way we make concrete typically nowadays is with Portland cement, which you make by baking limestone at 2,600 degrees F and mixing in a little bit of trace elements. Mm -hmm. And there you go, you've got Portland cement. It's a fabulous, it's a fabulous building material. You can do all sorts of stuff with it and we do. So it's unfortunately it has this huge carbon footprint. And so uh, the building world, the, the, the concrete industry, the cement industry, they're all aware of this and they're all working really hard. There's a lot of money and a lot of brains going into uh, changing that. Uh, there's uh, new kinds of cement and there's ways of augmenting or supplementing cement in concrete so you can still get the same end product with the same strength or durability you want without such a high carbon footprint. Um, in, the, in the near term, um, clay is proving to be one of our, our best and fastest early methods to reduce the footprint. You, if you lightly bake clay, not fully bake it, but just 800 degrees or something, lightly calcine it, grind it up and mix it with the cement, you end up with something that's much lower, 30% lower footprint, but still gets the job done, makes you the concrete you want. There's other things where on the longer term, we're making concrete with, with algae and bacteria. There's a company in North Carolina, Biomason, there's making bricks with bacteria and no fossil fuel inputs. Fabulous do technology. Know, do you know how that's, how, how is that done? Do you What's the procedure for that? That sounds super interesting. Well, they they uh, they have a, a a magic formula, and they have to they only make bricks. They have to make it in their factory. They can't do it on your site, but they make it in a in a solution, um, and they they make their bricks, put them in the put them in the bathtub, and they come to strength in a day or two, and they're ready to go. And no, you know, they don't, nothing's heated up and nothing's pressurized. It's just ready to go. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to scale up and do more things. Uh, we're, I think they're working with the Department of Defense now in some fashion. Um, but they're the, they're the tip of the iceberg they're the, or the point of the spear in the sense of, I, I fully imagine that lots more bio-based concrete with algae, with bacteria, with fungi, I don't know, will be coming along and, uh, We'll get it. We'll get away as fast as we can, but it'll take a generation to get away from baking rocks to make concrete. We'll find we'll find other ways. Yeah, and, and there's plenty of people working on it, and plenty of products and cements, alternate cements out there that are in various stages of entering the marketplace. I mean, read the book; it's it's all. I I have heard of um, some. I mean, I don't know the, the technology behind it and the procedure behind it, but actually using fungi and mycelial um, organisms to build with. And I, I love the idea of that. And it's so interesting and cool, but I, I am puzzled by how that is actually, how that actually gets done. Like what are the mechanisms? And you may, you may or may not have the answers to this, but what are the mechanisms at play when you're, we're building with mushrooms? Well, we're, we're really, there's, there's a company doing this course, Ecovative out of New York has been around for a while and they're mostly doing packaging, yeah. which is fine because we need to replace styrofoam peanuts and cutting down trees to make cardboard and so on. So they're making packaging mostly. Um, they may try again to get back into the built environment space and making insulation. Uh, I don't know their plans. I haven't talked to those guys for a while, but they're working with mycelia. Um, which will, in the presence of moisture and with some cellulose to eat, they'll grow anywhere. And so the basic idea is you get some sawdust or some newsprint or any kind of cellulose you can find. There's lots of waste cellulose in the world. And you mix it with their magic formula and spray it in your wall and it 
grows and turns into insulation. And I'm sure they figured out ways to stabilize it and to stabilize it against moisture damage or fire. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know a lot of details, but but that's the basic idea. People think of of fungi a, as mushrooms, but of course, mushrooms that you see on the forest floor are not the fungi. Those are the fruits that the fungi mm -hmm. grows from underground. The mycelia are all underground. That's what we're working with. And again, just a point of the spear thing. We're just getting started learning to work with microbes, all the, all the various categories of organisms that are too small to see or are, not, are hidden underground like mycelia. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, personally, I'm, I'm convinced that they're going to be our salvation. The little ones are going to come and save our ass because we'll learn how to engage their partnership to make insulation or roofing or concrete or the things that we need to shelter ourselves from the elements. Yeah, it really seems like we're only limited by our imagination when, when it comes to working with microbes. And I agree with you there. It, that's that's going to be our, those are going to be our best friends. Yeah, and we're just we're just getting started. So, cool. yeah. Um, well, the structure the structure of a building in and of itself um, tends to contribute thirty to fifty percent of the embodied carbon emissions. In industrialized areas, such as places where we live, the three main structural materials are concrete, as we've talked about, steel, and wood. And like most things in life, I know the answer to the following question is it depends. But which building material? do you find is best? And I know that is going to be, it depends. So what does it depend on? Um, well, it does depend on a lot of things. Um, mass timber construction, which maybe people have heard of by now is, is sort of the poster child for this embodied carbon movement and this carbon positive or carbon storing buildings movement. Now, you, instead of building a concrete building, you can build an all wood building because what started in World War II with plywood, which kind of took over because it was such a cool product and everybody loves it and it's everywhere and, and then oriented strand board and particle board. And then we learned how to take a bunch of two by fours or two by sixes and glue them together and call it a beam, a glue lamb beam. And then you could do all sorts of stuff with that. And we've done a lot of cool stuff with that. Now we've taken it the next step further and make entire slabs and columns and everything else. And so you can have a pretty large building uh, made entirely out of wood, some metal fasteners, metal connectors here and there. If you really wanted to, you could, you could do it without any metal, like the old timber framers do with dowels and stuff. But um, mostly you do it with metal. And that's great. And, and, they, and they're lovely buildings. And they're durable and fire resistant and all the things you want them to be, but they're not necessarily good for the climate. Generally they are, but it's, it's easily, you know, I could, I could create a case study for you where a, a, an all wood building had the same carbon footprint as an all concrete building. If you had a really lean concrete that had a very low footprint and a wood that was by contrast, wood that was sourced from an unprotected, non-sustainably harvested forest, which is, far more common than not around North America, mm -hmm. then this really wasn't any big improvement as far as the climate is concerned. If I'm gonna be part of a two day long conference with 40 of the experts on forestry and buildings and lumber next week uh, to try to hash through where, where can we go? What kind of roadmap do we need for responsible wood use in the built environment? When I wrote the new carbon architecture, I asked my friend, Jason Grant, a longtime forest activist and the organizer of next week's conference. Can we, can we actually really ramp up our wood use, mass timber buildings everywhere, replacing the concrete and steel without you know, screwing the forest and the forest ecosystem? And he said, well, I never thought about it that way. Let me think about it. He started talking to all of his friends and all these emails were flying back and forth. And uh, the gist was, he came back and wrote a piece for the new carbon architecture saying, yes, we could. We could ramp it up a lot and still manage the forest properly. We're certainly not there yet, um, but we conceivably could at least so that I think the short answer to that is that if you live in, a, in an area where there's a lot of softwood forests, basically the northern hemisphere, because um, there's not much in the southern hemisphere, um, then yeah, you could build with lumber. Uh, wood instead of concrete or steel and it would be a good thing to do mm -hmm. 
but it really, it, and you could, there's so many factors at play that we have, we you have to know how to know. And we're only still figuring out how to do carbon accounting. So that if I buy an I-beam or I buy a sheet of plywood or I buy some gypsum board or whatever it is, that I can have a sense right there on the spot of what kind of footprint it has. Mm-hmm. We're, we're still a few years away from having the databases we need and the accounting methods. We, there's competing, there's like several competing accounting methods for doing this. So it's quite a lot of chaos. And I'm working with the federal government uh, and with um, big international standards organizations to try to write low carbon or carbon storing uh, regulations to try to promote things, try to move the industry in this direction. And it's part of the resistance we get, which is kind of bogus, but with some truth, they say, well, we don't even know how to measure it yet. How can we even compare anything? Because there's so much inaccuracy and it's, it's, it's still a, a moving target and a young industry of how do we even account for this stuff and even know really what is the footprint of whatever it is we're talking about. And they're right, they're right. Mm-hmm but we're knowing more all the time and we're getting better all the time. Uh, uh, some folks in Seattle, mostly sponsored, I think by, by Microsoft and good on you, Microsoft uh, have created this online open source tool, embodied carbon and construction calculator, EC3, uh, by which you can start to compare different products all across the spectrum in your carpeting or lights or pipe or especially concrete. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people are contributing to it all the time and adding to it and using it to make informed choices as they build. Mm-hmm. EC3, check it out. Yeah, okay. And I imagine a big part of that is going to be um, life cycle assessments as well. Um, well, that's to- what's behind it. Life yeah. cycle assessment is what I mean. Is that and is we're that's the accounting system or systems that are all developing that produce, that spit out at the end of the pipe, an uh, environmental product declaration, an EPD. Mm-hmm. And that's what you see uh, online. It's at something like EC3, where it's a bunch of EPDs and you can compare different rebar from different manufacturers or different sheetrock or whatever you're looking for. Mm-hmm. The, the LCA, the life cycle assessment is the accounting work that you do in order to end up with an EPD, an environmental product declaration. Yeah. Which is the which is the equivalent of the of the label in the car when you're in the car lot and looking at cars and what your mileage is and so on, or the label on your on a can of food that tells you what's in it. And I think um, one of the important things to consider when looking at these EPDs is what time scale does that or is that life cycle assessment coming from? In the book, you highlight this. There's three different types of life cycle assessments: cradle to cradle. Um, cradle to site and what was the other one uh cradle to grave i suppose uh, i yeah. don't remember but yeah there's there's a lot of discussion about that um but w- right now they're typically a1 to a3 phase meaning extraction from the ground manufacture and out the factory gate and that's mm-hmm. what most EPDs measure. They, they don't because they can't say anything about how long it has to travel and by what means it has to travel between the factory gate and your job site, nor anything about how long it might last and how durable it might be, nor anything about what happens at the end of life when the building's torn down or burned or can it be recycled or whatever. So our accounting systems aren't robust and refined enough to deal with that, nor at the front end. If you're working with wood from a sustainably harvested forest, that's even before the A1 stage. How, how does the LCA account for that? It doesn't very well right now, if it does at all. Or if I'm using straw products, uh, there's a great company in Europe, EcoCocon, just starting to arrive in North America. Uh, prefabricated straw panels in wood frames, the ma- maximum plant material, making pretty good sized commercial buildings, great product. but the LCA systems we have right now don't do a very good job of accounting for the fact that you've buried all that carbon in your building and give you credit for it. Mm -hmm. And they better because pretty soon there's going to be money involved. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it seems like in the best interest of these companies to really have different locations all over the world to even make that transport even shorter. Oh yeah. 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 We we're going to, we're going to be localizing things a lot more just like we tried, you know, 
people localize, try to get food from a farmer in your area and try to gather your own water and generate your own power on your rooftop or something. Uh, uh, everything's localizing. Governance is localizing more and more. We started a building code here in Marin, a low carbon concrete building code in the hopes that it would go viral, that it would be sort of a guerrilla operation. And it's working. It's, it is going viral. It's a number of states and I've talked to people in other countries because nobody tried to do that before. Nobody tried to address uh, carbon emissions through building code. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just had the right circumstances here, uh, great building official to work with. And, and so we made it happen and made a bit of a splash. So if I'd have yeah, tried sure. to do it nationally on the big organizations that write building codes, it would have taken 10 years, a whole lot of money and be really watered down by the time we were done. Yeah. Um, because, because the rules are written by the big money organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking, speaking of local is, um, and you covered this in, in the book, but is there a chance that, you know, we can get too local, we can build too tall. Like since I was in university, the, the mantra was essentially we need to build up rather than out, but are there limitations to that? I imagine there are quite a few. Oh, don't get me started. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. Um, <laughs> For, for, for a great number of reasons, uh, I argue that, um, as do many of my colleagues, that we really shouldn't be building more than 15, 20 stories. Mm -hmm. um, for the carbon footprint that goes shooting way up, carbon footprint per square meter of space, um, for the effect on a downtown space, you're shutting off light and, and sunlight and air to the streets down below um, for what it does to transit. It's not, it, it, when, we, when we say, it's a good thing that people are moving to cities. Humanity has been urbanizing more and more and more. We crossed a threshold 10 or 15 years ago where more than half of humanity was in an urban area. And that by every measure is good. It's better for protection of women. It's better for education of children and girls. It's better for personal carbon footprint. The average New York City resident has a much lower footprint than I do. Mm -hmm. But how do we do that without building really tall buildings? Well, that's easy. You don't build really tall buildings. If, if you look at most cities, there's a bunch of really tall buildings downtown, and they comprise about typically about 10% of the enclosed space in that city. And they account for about 50% of the energy usage in that city because they're typically glass walled mm -hmm. in every part of the world, in every climate. And, every, and so um, we don't need those. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of discussion now about repurposing them in the, after the pandemic when people aren't going to be in a hurry to return to going to the office every day and companies don't need them to because we now yeah. realize we can all work from home. So what, what's going to happen with the buildings we've got? I don't know. And people love to build them. People love to, people love to build really tall buildings. It's not just a guy phallic thing. It's, it's, I don't know. There it is. But they're not good. And if I were if I were in charge, I'd say nothing over 20 stories, make allowance for some sort of exceptions. But really, the old historic cities, the great cities of the world, the, the Paris's and London's and Beijing's and Rome's, part of what makes them so wonderful, and we go visit them, go tourists there, is they, they're not so tall that you don't get light and air down on the street. They have open plaza, open spaces, mm -hmm. and they're limited by how high they can go because they were using natural materials. It's, you can only go so high with stone or with big, massive wood columns. Um, now we have technology. We could probably go higher with those natural materials. But also it's limited by how far people could go upstairs because they didn't have elevators. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I'd bring it back to that scale. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's other reasons too, but yeah, I'd, I'd bring everything back to that scale. So urbanizing everybody is a good idea, but it doesn't mean and shouldn't mean building really tall buildings in the, in the city core. Yeah. You need to do it a little bit smarter. I've got, I want to be respectful of your time. I've got quite a bit of uh, questions from the audience here. Um, this first question is from Zoe. And they're asking consideration for building new big residential houses with old methods and material like stone with resources. Hmm, I think there might be a bit of a language barrier here. I don't know why you're building, why I see people build big houses with natural materials and I don't get it. You know, if you're, 
don't build big, build small. Yeah. Build small in quality. Don't we in America, we build these huge freaking mansions and, and other places too. I've seen them in New Zealand and lots of places. Don't build big, build small. Okay. Yeah. It's um, little Mick mansions just popping up everywhere. It's, oh boy. Yeah. Um, this question is from Ben and he is asking, how optimistic are you that new carbon architecture can and will be adopted in densely urban areas? Um, I'm optimistic because I, I think human beings can be cool. That's the opening line of my new book. Human beings can be really cool. People in the favelas and in the slums, I've done some work in Nairobi and in Cuba and a lot of places where people are really poor in Haiti. And they're also very inventive and they make really good use of whatever they have around them. And that is natural building. That is low carbon building. It's making use of the humanity, the human resources and the brains because we're a really, really freaking clever primate. And we're a social primate. And when we work together, we can do really cool stuff. Um, so we do need to craft policy in all the countries, especially the big industrial countries to guide things that way and make it easy to work with whatever is at hand. And that's kind of what I do in my life work, but I'm very optimistic. Yeah. I think some, I think a really cool future might actually be in front of us though. It doesn't tend to look that way sometimes. Yeah. The, it's, it's so cool to even learn about all this stuff it is fascinating as a climate scientist it's it's such a relief that well in fact i wonder if climate scientists have modeled it what if what if tomorrow we could stop burning fossil fuels and remove a half a teraton half the carbon we put up there for the industrial revolution and just have it disappear nature nature doesn't turn on a dime no. there are no right angles in nature but um i wonder like how fast could we turn it around and bring it back to pre-industrial conditions? I don't know the answer to that. And yeah. I the answer is it depends on a lot of things. <laughs> it's, always, it's always the answer. It always depends. Yeah. Um, next question is, who do you think needs to read this book? What demographic? Where are the hubs that will have the biggest ripple effect of positive change? Well, people in the industry, I hope, would. Architects, engineers, builders. If you're contemplating a building project just for yourself personally, it's usually for most people, it's the biggest capital expenditure you'll ever make. It's building or adding to a home. I mean, it's, it's a lot of bucks, a couple more zeros on the end of that check than for most of the things you do. So it's a big deal. So it's nice to know the underlying principles behind choices that you might make. And then you as the person building something can influence the people you hire to do it for you who might not otherwise pay any attention. But you can say, hey, did you... Do you have, happen to know what the carbon footprint of our concrete is in this area? Then mm -hmm. pe make people aware. Certainly policymakers uh, have a lot of leverage. Uh, every chance I get to work with any, anybody at any level of policymaking, I do. Um, and then venture capitalists are always looking. They, they, they backed away from doing anything in the building material space because it's, it's, a, it's such a tough space. It, it doesn't turn around real fast and it's, it's a long, long haul. So it needs patient capital, not the impatient capital that characterizes venture investing. But yeah. um, even so, we need we need some patient investments, some some long term money to support the people who are creating the products. That will... Ben has another question for you. He says, um, "Well, first he says that uh, you are cool." <laughs> He's wondering what your morning routine is. What my morning routine is? Yeah. Um, he's wondering if I meditate, isn't he? Likely. I do. A couple hours every morning. A cup a of coffee, hours. check the news. And uh, I've been meditating daily for 50 years. Amazing. I used to be a, I used to be a monk. For real? How's that? That's very, and that's then, funny. and then uh, uh, I get up and uh, see what happens. Yeah, and some sort of shit storm happens, and then I collapse in bed later that day. <laughs> that's that's my daily routine. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's a real one. I don't personally don't meditate for for two hours every two hours. Uh, anywhere between one and two. It depends on a lot of things, but amazing. I, I rarely go. My I never go without at least five minutes. Yeah. But yeah, it's just it's 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 nothing I'm boasting about. It's it's just like a, a habit I can't break, and it hasn't really had any noticeable effect on me. Ask my wife, but <laughs> um, it's a nice way to start the day. Yeah. Yeah. Be this, still. Oh, this next question is from Lynx Acres, and they're saying I read recently an article about how indigenous peoples usually had many villages, but kept, generally kept villages to a limited number of people. So the area supported each village so they could actually rely on their surroundings. What are your thoughts on that? I hadn't heard that. Uh, uh, Pre-industrial days, you, you could only have uh, a city that could be supported by the surrounding environs. Mm -hmm. um, so if you outgrew your food capacity, then either people died or people had to move on someplace else. And so that sort of dynamic has always been there. It's less so now because we can move things around. We use fossil fuels and trains and jets and so on. And I, you know, I have I have raspberries from Chile in my in my refrigerator in the other room, and it's not even a big deal. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there is uh, different from that. There is a dynamic, and I write a long piece about it for this new book that people figured out that. Uh, the optimal size for a human group is something like 180, 150, 180, 200 people. It's called the Dunbar number after a British anthropologist who noticed it, that the sizes of tribes tend to vary. The size of the typical wedding, a big wedding is rarely more than 200. And then somebody traced to the, the size of primate skulls and compared them to social group sizes. They studied gorillas, chimpanzees. Um, wow. Mar uh, all sorts of, all the primates, all of our cousins on the family tree, and then their skull sizes, and found a very direct correlation between skull size and group size. And for our skull size, 180 is our number. That's Check incredible. It out. And Above that's 180, up to 180, um, you pretty much know everybody, and you can govern yourselves by consensus and socially. Yes. Yeah. Above that, you don't. And uh, you start to get into where you need to write down rules. You need to write a constitution or company guidelines or whatever it might be. And then it gets tricky because it's it's impossible to write rules that work all the time. I just yeah. read a thing about the U.S. Constitution. It has its own its own provision for changing itself. Mm -hmm. Amendment five. You have to, when you write a set of rules, you have to write a rule for how do you change the rules and adapt as time goes by. And they were smart enough to do that in 1776 or 86. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, that was the Dunbar number? The Dunbar number. Robin Dunbar. Robin Dunbar. James Miller is asking, what are some other things we can do on a small scale to minimize the footprint we leave behind? Oh, I think everybody knows that, right? Eat less meat. Uh, don't don't buy raspberries from chili and keep them in the you know, ride a bike when you can. Don't don't drive a car. Um, but the thing is, this is this is a, this is the question you're really asking. We we obsess. If you're at all conscious about this, and you you you're aware of the climate, and you want to do what you can, you see this all the time. And so you, you just you start freaking out, and you get obsessed with re reducing my footprint. I got to reduce my footprint. I eat less meat. I'm gonna be vegan. I'm gonna I'm gonna give up my car. Well, fine. Reduce your footprint, yes, but far more important is, uh, and this is from my friend Greg Norris. Uh, I think he's now at uh, Living Futures Institute. He teaches at Harvard, but this wonderful guy, Greg Norris, said, have a green handprint. Have something positive you do. Teach, form, an organiz form a recycling organization, make people aware do whatever you can. That's all I've ever done is just looked around. Oh, I could do that. And I'll go do it. Nobody else is doing it. So I'll go do that. I'll write that book or I'll, that's all I ever did. And I managed to do some stuff and you can too. Yeah. Keep your footprint small. Just make sure your handprint is bigger. Your green handprint is bigger than your gray footprint. 
That's what you need to do. And how that works out for you, I don't know. Ben or any anybody else, you figure it out, but I'll bet you can. Yep, that's fantastic advice. I've got one more question from the audience and then I have my own personal question that I like to wrap up interviews with. Links Acres is asking, would buildings like straw bale houses be better carbon wise? And I'm not sure if they're asking um, a new build or retrofit or, or what. But... Are they better than what? Just, uh, just better? Just better. Are they better carbon wise? Usually, I mean, if the alternative is 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 ordinary wood framing, um, usually, yeah. If you do it right, so that you know, protect it and make sure it won't get wet and rot or something. But like in California wildfires, they've performed better than the wood frame buildings, so they're superior in a fire. Mm -hmm. um, their durability has been established. You can screw up a straw bale building, but you can screw up any kind of building. You can screw up a steel building or a concrete building. There's no perfect building material. But yeah, straw bale is generally better. I just, I'm, I'm much more interested in, so to speak, straw bale 2.0 and the products and things by which we can uh, extend straw bale beyond just the, the stereotypical hippie house on the, on the quarter acre up in the woods, which is not a great model for 99% of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather leave the woods unbothered and move into the city. Uh, so how do, how do we use straw in the city? Well, there are ways and people are developing insulation systems and so on. But if you have a piece of land and you want, you're going to build a house, yeah, build a straw bale house, probably better than uh, your alternatives, carbon yeah. ones. Cool. I have one more question for you. And totally hypothetical situation. You are made the minister of education and it's your job to get anyone who graduates high school to read one to three books, one to three. Which books are they and why? Wow. Uh, just across the board, what books? Yeah. Wow. I guess another way to ask this, which, which three books would you say have inspired you or left a profound footprint on yourself that is directing you in a positive way and that you yeah. wish that younger folks um, can, can get a hold of that feeling. Well, the, of course, there's a world of great spiritual literature. I think of the Tao Te Ching, uh, Stephen Mitchell's translation, or the Bhagavad Gita, um, or Rumi, of course. Uh, Nader Khalili's uh, translations of Rumi are the best. But then um, Stuart Brand is one of the thinkers I admire most. Uh, another local here, the founder of, started the Long Now Foundation to try to stretch humanity's sense of time back out again we've all become so compressed into the moment and um he wrote a book he's not even a, a builder or an architect or anything but he writes insightfully about this world he wrote how buildings learn which is a classic now um or the eco pragmatist manifesto another Stuart brand um well in fact here, here's a, a, a better answer to your question Stuart Brand started this foundation called The Long Now, and they, um, they're whole artists, scientists, all sorts of interesting people, and they sponsor all sorts of talks. You can find them online. Um, whose whole purpose is to, is to stretch our imagination back out beyond the, the compressed insanity of this moment uh, at the hour or day or even year or decade scale to century scale. They're building a clock of the long now out in the desert in West Texas that's gonna that will chime every hundred years and ring every thousand years and then every ten thousand years something else happens. Well they have a bar of the long now right here in San Francisco in Fort Mason. It's on the water and it has only liquors that are made within a hundred miles, which actually is a lot, a lot of wine and whiskey and beer and that's a lot of fun. But the cool part is the library. Stuart Brand he was the guy who's responsible for the reason why you can see readily see pictures of the earth, which are everywhere now. You don't even think about a picture of the earth. But when NASA started sending space flights in, into orbit and then to the moon, Stuart Brand was this guy. And he was just this hippie in San Francisco. He said, how come we haven't seen pictures of the earth? And NASA was holding on to him like, oh, it's secret. And he started a movement to sort of, and NASA started releasing them. And that became the cover of the whole earth catalog that sort of, uh, 
characterized, you could say, the whole hippie thing in the 60s, but also launched a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So now he's um, he's trying to stretch our imaginations back out. And in this bar the long now, Stuart contacted his 100 best friends, which is 100 really interesting people, and said, if you were, if civilization collapsed tomorrow and you had only 10 books with you to restart civilization, which 10 books would you have? The library that's in the bar of the long now in Fort Mason in San Francisco are the books that his friends answered with. Everything from a Granger repair manual for metal electric motors cool. to philosophy to um, a lot of history to uh, all sorts of stuff. And I'm sure the, the titles are all online if you went to the, the foundation of the long now website. Uh, so you, you know, caught me off guard with that question, three books. I'd have to think about that for a while, okay. but I invite everybody to think about that because it, it tells you a little bit about where, where you, what you think matters. Yeah, where you've been and where you want to go to. We're a cool species. We're so cool. I, I think that's not appreciated enough. We're incredibly capable of doing amazing things. I'll, 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 I'll leave you with an image. This okay. from this from the poet Gary Snyder, who's been my hero and hero to a lot of people for a long time. He's pretty old now. I saw him a year ago, uh, ninety now. But um, and uh, if, boy, if you don't know Gary Snyder, I'm not going to try to unpack that. But Buddhism and natural history and ethno studies and Northwest Pacific tribes and a lot of other things, and a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. And he built his own house for his family uh, in the Sierra foothills, a few hours away from me here. And he was giving a talk one night at a, at a local bookstore and said how one night, uh, a summer evening, he was out gathering some firewood. His house was out in the woods. And he's walking back and his, his daughter was practicing piano in the open window, summer evening, just a beautiful dusky. And... Uh, he sort of slowed down to enjoy it. And then as he was approaching the house, he noticed that there was a silhouette in the window. His daughter was inside with a little soft yellow light and he could hear the piano and there was a silhouette in the window. What the? And it was a mountain lion. And he said, uh, I, somehow I was sure that he wasn't about to attack my daughter or anything. He was just listening. He was just listening to the piano. He says, and I, and I, slowed way down and crept as close as I could. But eventually I, I snapped a twig or something and, and the lion snapped its head around and was gone, disappeared. Mm -hmm. But he uses that, used that that evening as I do now to illustrate that we, we can, the creatures are ready to welcome us back when we stop behaving like assholes and find our place at the dinner table again, instead of behaving like drunken teenagers and spitting on everybody. Uh, that's the image that I hold, that, that when we're laughing and singing and playing Mozart on the piano, the creatures gather around to listen because there's nothing like it in the world. Yeah. Well, thank you for putting a beautiful image in my head. Thank you all. Wh whoever else is here, I can't tell who we are, but thank you for coming. Yes. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Bruce, for taking the time out of your day to have a little chat with me. It was insightful and cool. <laughs> My pleasure. We all be well. We'll see you in the future. Have fun until then. And um, I just want to take the, the small time to say that we have a permaculture summit coming up. Um, so Bruce, if you're even interested in coming by, we have 19 amazing perm permaculture practitioners talking about how they overcame overwhelm and started their own permaculture properties. Cool, cool. Um, Is Penny Livingston one of them? No. She's an old friend. I'll look her up. Oh yeah, she's one of the old timers in permaculture, yeah. But let, send me the link, let me know. Yeah, if uh, you just go to vergepermaculture.ca, it'll be the first thing you see. Okay. Thanks again, Bruce. Thanks Have everybody. Stay yeah. safe, and we'll see you in the future. Bye-bye.